geometry. Now, few of us recall that requirement of our education with affection, particularly those of us who are English majors. How in the world could knowing the properties and relationships of points, lines, surfaces, solids, help us express ourselves and communicate effectively? Such mathematical knowledge surely could not help us make sense of the world. Well, to Daniel Castor, geometry has always been so much more than mathematics. For him, it is art. And what is art? It is something that is created with imagination and skill and which beautifully expresses important ideas or feelings. And the art of this biracial son of missionaries almost has a mission of its own. Danny makes visible hidden relationships of lines, points, surfaces, and solids. His constructions provide evidence of not only the validity of geometric proofs, that mathematical method of making sense of the world, but more importantly, Danny shows us its magic. Cosmic principles are involved here, folks. So, who is this guy? Malaysian born and raised in Tennessee, Daniel Castor was a good student. He graduated from Princeton and earned a master's degree at Harvard. Uh, supported by a Fulbright grant, he spent a few years in Amsterdam developing ways to represent complex building interiors. Now, that means putting on paper the relationship of a building's interiors to that building's exteriors. These were drawings so beyond Escher. Danny then found himself creating drawings at the Getty Museum Research Institute and exhibiting his work and the Los, Angel Los Angeles Getty Museum. Danny Castor says at this point in his life, he was a quasi-academic artist and occasional architect facing a very important life decision. Should he be an academic and teach? Should he be a full-time artist? Or should he be a professional architect? That difficult question was answered when he met and married my much loved former neighbor, whom you know, the designer of our recent OAC handbook and OAC member, Jennifer Jurdy. So what did Danny do? He chose architecture because it would reliably support a family. And it did. During those years, while he was a practicing architect, husband and dad, Danny found a unique outlet for our artistic geometric endeavors. Now, you got to think back. Remember those Memorial Day parades when representing Greenwood School, these wild creations would emerge? A dragon float. The next year, as stellated Aksohedron. <laughs> Okay, icosahedron. I put it in syllables and it's a good one. And most amazingly, remember the year when two Leonardo uh, da Vinci inspired wooden polyhedrons, one adult sized, one child sized. Remember those? Like that? And they rolled down Miller Avenue in the parade. Danny made those. 
Well, 20 years uh, plus later, Danny and Jen's daughters have flown from their Mill Valley nest and are away at college. Of course, each girl is in art school. Still a practicing architect, Danny now has room in his creative life to imagine and build more amazing products of geometric knowledge. Did you see that 30 foot high uh, sunflower for Ukraine at the county fair? Danny made that. So settle down in your chair and listen up while opening your eyes wide. You are going to see and learn. Danny Castor, welcome to the Outdoor Art Club. Okay, that's good. I can, uh, that seems good. So um, let's get rid of that, that stuff. Okay, let me take a deep breath and situate myself. There's some familiar faces out there. Hi, Joanne and Patty. It's good to see you again. I have a mild dysgraphia, so there's probably other people that I should know that I can't recognize. Please say hello when you get a chance. Um, I wanted to tell you that the first time I ever came to Mill Valley was to come to this building. Um, my sister was doing her medical residency up in Santa Rosa, and uh, a friend of hers was getting married here, and she said, Danny, why don't you come be my date? So I was living in San Francisco at the time, and uh, I came up. I had actually at that point already met Jen once. Um, and I knew that she lived in this town. That was about it. And I did not know that I would spend the next 23 years of my life here. <laughs> so <laughs> in a way it all started here. Um, I used to give talks. Um, it's been about 25 years since I've talked about my work. Um, I was a Sort of a, as Linda said, a quasi academic. I spoke uh, at RISD. Um, did I just lose it? Okay. Into the star. Into the star. Okay. Um, Gainesville, uh, British Columbia. I, I was kind of um, establishing myself as a on the on the lecture circuit. I was showing my drawings at architecture schools, um, but that was a very narrow uh, way of life. And as you'll see, it's gotten a lot, a lot broader. This is such a great opportunity, and I really sincerely thank you for inviting me and allowing me to do this, um, because it allows me to think about the things that I've done in the meantime and to kind of collect my thoughts. Um, that's what I'm getting out of this. For you, uh, what are you getting out of this? That's always a good question to ask. Um, this is like, I think, a um, correspondence first-person view of what a community can do to shape a person's life. Um, so, you know, meeting Jen, coming to Mill Valley, our children to the schools, to the community at large, that is inextricable from what it is that, I, that I'm doing and the way that I think about my work and why I think I should find it be interesting. It, it's one thing to create in a vacuum and I'm perfectly happy to do that. You'll see, but it means so much more when it means something to other people as well. So I'm going to talk, um, if you want a little roadmap to today's um, presentation, I'm going to talk about that academic beginning, uh, talk a bit about the practice, talk about how um, our family life has uh, informed that, and, and we're moving into a new territory. I'll always be an architect. Um, but there are other things in life. So I think that's the preamble. I'm showing you a photograph of um, Wesley Methodist Church in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So my dad's actually from upstate New York. He uh, grew up on an apple farm. He was in Cornell Ag School during the Second, Second World War. He left school and volunteered, ended up serving in Bastogne. 
he came back, uh, finished up school, and shortly thereafter entered seminary. Um, he was always a deeply religious person. Um, uh, he was a fun, fun guy. Um, he wanted to be a missionary to India. They closed the doors to missionaries at a certain point, and he diverted, ended up being uh, a pastor in Malaysia. Um, so this is dad, the Reverend Howard Paul Castor. Uh, this is the church. Um, and um, my mother, um, ethnically Chinese, her family's been in Malaysia for generations. Uh, she went to England um, for school, came back, was a school teacher at the Methodist Girls School. She ended up being principal there. Um, they met. Her first husband died tragically uh, very, very early on in their relationship. And um, my dad, who was a confirmed bachelor and a man on a mission, <laughs> he was really, you know, kind of a head, head, in, the, head in the clouds. And, and they met. And... Um, so I lived in Malaysia and Singapore until I was nine. We moved to, to Tennessee um, because they wanted us to finish school in the States. They made that sacrifice, even though my dad had been over there for almost 20 years. Um, my, after arriving, my mom, um, who turns 90 in May, um, she decided that she too felt the call. She went to seminary. She was ordained a Methodist clergywoman. And she got her own church in Knoxville, Tennessee. So you can imagine in the 1980s, an Asian clergywoman in Knoxville, Tennessee. I am really proud of my mom. Um, yeah, so um, those are the beginnings. Let's fast forward to Harvard. And here I am, just one of many, many talented students working like a dog all night long on my little architecture projects. And I don't know, it was... It was great, but I concocted the scheme to get a one-year European vacation by applying for the Fulbright. <laughs> I was very clever. You didn't need to learn a, a, a different language to go to, to, to Amsterdam. Anyway, um, this was the building that I wanted to study. This is the Burs von Berlach. It's the Amsterdam Exchange. It's this huge brick pile in downtown Amsterdam. Um, a very important building. I won't bore you with the details. It's all kind of history. Um, it was finished in 1903. I just quickly, um, it was kind of a transitional building. It had a lot of traditional elements, but it was becoming modern, flat, rational, um, and people in Amsterdam hated it. <laughs> so, um, you know, a lot of people said, oh, you're going to Amsterdam. It's the Euro Disney of sin. And uh, there were, I, I love the Dutch. I really do. I have tremendous affection for them and their country and their struggles and, and the things that they do right. Wow, I really learned a lot. Um, but the people that I met there were not interested in the building that I was studying. And so it was my challenge um, to show them what was interesting. So I got to work. This is me in my studio, which they, this is the sort of the beginning of the kind of out of body, incredible privileged experiences that I've had, but they gave me a studio in the same building with a key. So I could go there in the middle of the night and wander around. Um, just briefly, I looked at a number of things in the building, but I just want to show you these drawings. These are looking at the entries into the building um, from the point of view of language and space. So we've got a keystone, this balustrade. There are certain elements that appear over and over again. Each of these different uh, entries serve a different organization. They're in different parts of the building that have different roles. And so this to me was architecture as language, but what's happening inside as well, the, the language isn't just surface, it's spatial. So how do you communicate your excitement um, to, to the lay person, the non-architects? Well, you basically make eye candy, <laughs> but, but it's accurate. So these are all hand drawings. These were, these were 3D perspective drawings um, made by hand. Um, it's not like computers didn't exist. I just couldn't afford to have one. So um, I did it the old, I did it the old fashioned way. Anyway, that was a great experience. Um, not only because I met great people and I, and I, you know, I just revered this building. Um, but um, Holland was very, very good to me. 
Um, I got subsequent funding from the Dutch Ministry of Culture to stay for another year and a half. The Dutch, the Netherlands Architecture Institute published a book um, that was my thesis at Harvard. I, I worked on this project longer than most students were at Harvard. <laughs> so my original class, they just where's Danny? They graduated and left, and here I was in Amsterdam. I finally came back and graduated with a bunch of people that I didn't know. But in the meantime, I had this exhibition at the Netherlands Architecture Institute in Rotterdam, um, just a real high point in my, um, in my young life. And then um, I came back to um, San Francisco at the time and, and got back to my job freelancing for Marcus <laughs> Jackson. <laughs> and trying to um, work as a, as a practitioner, you know, because, yeah, I got my degree. But anyway, I parlayed those drawings into a, an application to the, uh, to the Prix de Rome, to the Rome Prize, which has been around for a long time. And in some of the very early days, it was like, wow, the Rome Prize. You get to go and live at the American Academy in Rome, which is this thing. This is their campus for a year. They'll give you an apartment and a studio, feed you, and take you on trips, showing you around not just Rome, but, you know, Sicily and blah, blah, blah. So I was like, what's not to like about that? So I got that. Uh, I went fall of 97, um, and I was there for a year. Oh, by the way, this is, um, just to situate you, this is on the Janiculum, which is above Trastevere, which is across the river from Rome. So this is the this is the dome of the Pantheon. This is the Palazzo Medici, which is the French embassy. This is a little bridge that you cross and you wind your way through Trastevere up to this hill. So um, designed by McKimmead and White, paid for by J.P. Morgan. Um, it's been around for about 100 years. This was my studio here. Not bragging. I'm just telling you, it was really, it was just amazing. Um, such a such a great experience but once again you know here's my community this is 30 people more or less archaeologists classicists italian studies uh, composers uh, visual artists um i was really shaped by them um they were in a way my audience for what i was doing again the academic audience seemed less interesting than sort of people good times were had by you are absolutely forbidden to enter the fountain. <laughs> it was it was July and very hot, and we were about to leave anyway. So what the heck? So um, I looked at a, at a number of different buildings. Um, this is this is the academy here. This is the Aqua Paolo, very famous place to, to take pictures of Rome. And then down here is Il Tempio di Bramante. This is the Tempietto. Um, this is San Pietro and Montorio. It's now actually the Spanish Academy, um, but I'm going to focus on this tiny building here, Vermontes Tempietto, um, built in 1500. It's considered the jewel of the Renaissance, um, designed by Vermonte, who went on to design St. Peter's uh, and was succeeded by Michelangelo. And um, this is kind of like perfectly proportioned little gem it's been drawn to death and it's like, why do you want to draw that? Well, it's because there's something interesting going on that I wanted to show. The altar inside the building looks like this. And what you don't know when you're in the main floor looking at the altar uh, is something I wanted to show you. So this is, this is the exterior, nothing interesting there, except I've rotated it 45 degrees. You can see that the door, can everybody see the cursor actually? Yeah, okay. The door is off to the side, so I rotate and you see the cross is at an angle, so now you oriented 45 degrees. I'm going to cut away a cross section here, and you can see the altar. And, whoa, look, there's a crypt down below, and it looks like there's a door in the back. That's a cross section. And then I'm going to do a long section. This is even more interesting, because you can see we're cutting through the front door, and there's the altar. And look, it's hollow. And in the back of the altar is a window, and that lights the space overhead as you come down into the sacred crypt. So um, what next? Let's draw the space of the building as if it's a solid, like you poured plaster into the space and removed the building like a cast. And if you combine the long section 
from the cast, you get the avocado. So this is taking, treating that solid negative like a pit and placing it into the long section. There you can see the, the solid form of the window well pressing up against the glass of the window. So is that interesting? I don't know. I'm just trying to show different ways to um, show the building. So this is the pit, if you will, against the silhouette of the building. Let's make that solid form transparent. Now it's looking like a jellyfish, which is, by the way, what I, that's my gimmicky name for these kinds of drawings is um, jellyfish. And you can see that this is semi-transparent. Well, let's make now everything. Let's show the outside detail. So you can see the front door. It's not been sliced open. You can see St. Peter on top of the altar and you can see the window all at the same time. That's the master drawing. So I made a big version of it with a lot more detail. Um, and it's basically a, a, a fancier version of the same thing, much more time consuming, obviously. But um, so there you have it. That was my that was my experience with the Tempi at all. So I came back from Rome. This is Wim de Witt. He's a Dutch scholar. Um, he was head of special collections at the Getty. And we've been talking for years. He was very interested in my work in Amsterdam very early on. He said, I want to have a show of your drawings at the Getty. And I said, I, I don't have any complaint about that idea. And um, it was supposed to be at the old Getty offices in Santa Monica. And then it took, you know, it took time and time. And then what do you know? In the meantime, they were building this. Um, it's kind of like Richard Meyer Acropolis um, overlooking the 405. And um, I did not mount my drawings in the museum. That's for people who are no longer with us. <laughs> I was I was 32, so they put me over here in the in the research institute. But it was still, uh, as you can imagine, um, a mountaintop experience uh, for me. This is me, um, you know, tender age of whatever it was, it was standing next to my this is my buddies from Chattanooga, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I look like you're happy, like about I am. Um, so this is, you know, this is an incredible uh, experience there. Um, so this is my this is my gang, uh, friends who came to the opening there. Here's my dad. Hi, dad. Here's my mother, and here's my sister. And uh, my sister said, "Danny, it's like a wedding, except you're marrying yourself." <laughs> She, she said, uh, you know, she wasn't saying it to be mean, but, but I, I didn't, I just, it's just, she really put my, she really stuck her finger in a sore spot. And um, here I was kind of on top of the world. And uh, as Linda explained to you, you know, I had a, I had, I had a serious decision to make. And it was around this time that I met Jen. She was actually, I think the second time I ever saw her, she was, um, she was there. I met her through her brother, so I had to proceed carefully. Um, but um, long story short, um, you know, I did some serious thinking, and, and architecture seemed like the path. And I was living anyway. Um, you know, we realized very quickly that we wanted to spend our lives together. And um, she even said, "Look, you've been offered this." Um, opportunity to go back to the Harvard Society of Fellows, three-year gig, I will move to Boston. And I just, was just, it just blew me away. She had her own practice. It was ridiculous. I couldn't ask her to do that. And um, so we somehow ended up in Mill Valley, talking about Mill. <laughs> that's my home. And uh, yeah, that's where we, that's where we set up shop. This is Nell. Um, she's setting up the camera for our family photo. This is our deck and our uh, what was Jen's house that became our house overlooking the Dipsy. Uh, um, you know, deep we had a dozen redwoods on the property, and this is the picture she took so long ago. Even the pictures are blurry. Um, oh yeah, and that's her. That's her baby sister, um, Gwenny. And here's you know that we made a life for ourselves here on Millside Lane, across the street from Linda. Um, there's Nell, she's not a little girl anymore. And there's Gwenny, she's getting really big, working on a, a class play 
stage sets for um, Greenwood School, and um, yeah, that was that was that was life. Set up shop in that crazy building by Grillies. Yeah, the Clady Junction building. I like to call this hot tub gothic. <laughs> Um, I had a, this is incredible office up here. It's like a little perch, um, and these are my these are my helpers at my desk uh, up up there. This is our first house we did in um, Mill Valley for our friends Marilyn and Adrian. It was a second floor addition. You know, I couldn't stop doing these drawings, even though it was kind of ridiculous. Um, they're like, how long did that take you? <laughs> it shows the original one story cottage with the second floor that we were going to add. Um, here's the house under construction. You know the house. They just sold it actually last summer and moved up to Sebastopol. The kids are gone, so you know they, they did really well. Um, we changed the orientation of uh, the porch. Really, again, this porch. This porch is all about. I hate to say it, community. I mean, this is the best place in town to be on Halloween, right? You can imagine it's facing the street and park yourself there with a big jack-o'-lantern full of candy and and just um, and then you know anyway that was our first experience in mill valley this is another one on one king at the intersection of king and blithedale um and david and lynn um they had they had been tinkering with this house for years we just to keep going with the jack-o'-lantern i mean we 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 gutted this house like a like we were scraping the inside of a pumpkin and rearranged everything but the house still looks like the house we just added this area here um, the art, uh, the contract, the architect, he should be one. The, the, the builder was, um, Michael Levinson is a really gifted craftsman. Um, just to, you know, I, there's only so much you can do with drawings and then somebody has to really figure out how to build it. And he just literally nailed it. Um, yeah, it's just super beautiful. And then the transition and this, he was pulling his hair out. Like, Good luck. <laughs> But uh, then his brother, Paul Levinson, also a local Mill Valley fellow, what a dream team, right? The brothers Levinson um, helped with the interiors and just just uh, making me making me look good. It's just a really, there's Lynn, she's playing the harpsichord. Uh, David's a glass artist. There's Uma, you may remember Uma, their dog. Um, they have since decamped to Santa Fe. So it's a big loss for the town, but they seem, they seem happy there. Um, this is on Ethel 195. Um, you know, pretty typical great room. We have the you know, old salvage lumber trusses. And we have a deck out here with views of Mill Valley. And then over here on the side, there's a courtyard. So we've got these nice retractable doors, pocket out of the way. And you can look from the courtyard through the house out to the deck. Super nice. And we like to hang out here. This is a view of that deck from down below. I saved the front for last because um, you may, I don't know, it's kind of down and out this location when you're if you're you know walking your dog on Ethel or whatever. But this is the view of it, and I, I showed this last because I want to show you Don Anderson, another dad that we met um, uh, at Greenwood, just you know just up the hill. He has a wood shop in Sausalito. The contractor said we, we can't do this. We've talked to all these people; they can't do it. I was like, okay, I'm calling Don, and he with his Japanese hand saws shaped the scallops out of this 12 inch square lumber cedar just uh, this is what i call cedar sashimi really i mean look at that can you even believe isn't that great oh really so tasty so that that is uh are we gonna are we gonna paint it no are we gonna stain it even no let's just let it go gray it's just you know so this is gonna i want to come back in 100 years don't we all and see what this looks like, but it's going to be just getting good. So you can see my drawing style has um, changed. Our drawings are all, uh, more cartoonish, you could say, but they're faster, they're more user friendly. This is expressly for the purpose of convincing the planning commission that <laughs> this should be allowable. This is on Ryan Avenue, so it's a block off of, um, so you may know this house. It's kind of out of the way, but this is Breezeway House. and. Uh, really, again, it really connects the community and passers-by on the street to what's happening inside the heart of the, the backyard. This is a view into the house. They did such a nice job with the interiors. It just really, they had so much fun with it. Happy for them. 
This is, uh, I don't, you, you must know Stephen Geisler. I don't, I've never met him. And maybe I don't want to because working on somebody else's house who's an architect is, that's a little, you know, anyway, I apologize to him in advance, but um, they sold their house to um, uh, a family that hired me to um, kind of update it for them. But you can see it's an Adirondack style. The, the bark, I mean, they were in this house for 25 years. So the bark is peeling off the, the tree trunks in the front and we just made it, you know, look like that. Um, just, this is just another aspect of the work that we do. We opened up this wall and made it look like that. So, you know, it's just styles come and go, um, but if the bones are good, you can always work with it. We worked on this house for six years. This is really a magnificent property. Um, we, we added a pool and we added the cabana and we were just, you know, it was really, really a lot of fun. I could just go on and on. I mean, this is, Jen's like, don't try to show too much, <laughs> but it's hard to stop. So this was actually a remodel of a place up in Sleepy Hollow. It was a low slung ranch house. You know what they're like, the bones, everything about the DNA is a prairie low slung, but we wanted height. The owner wanted height. So what I did was I vaulted what we had of the roof and then I mirrored that to create this butterfly effect. And again, the contractor just nailed it. He just um, did such a nice job, and it wasn't easy to make it look so clean and effortless. But that was super fun. This is a project in Belvedere I'm showing you because, again, we do these remodels. The kitchen was over here. This was a roof terrace with a with a railing with really nice views. And you know, the question was like, well, they wanted to redo the kitchen. I said, let's grab that space. You know, this was a wall with a door. Um, so you could, didn't even have this view. The The range was there. This was all there. And that's like not shabby at all. It's a beautiful situation there. But, but um, you know, you can imagine this was a wall and nobody ever came out here. So um, Jen's stepmom said about, I, you know, sometimes she's an architect too as well. They're everywhere. Um, it's like, you're, a, you're like a country doctor. And uh, I was like, well, you know, you... <laughs> show me your house and tell me where it hurts <laughs> i'll see if i can make it feel better which is not this is not something i wanted to hear at the beginning of my career but i've kind of eased into it um you know it's there there are many pleasures to be had i love helping people um you know but it's you know it's a, it's a, honestly it's a bit like i'm not gonna say that um and then it just goes on and on. I don't know. It, this, um, you know, this is a place up in San Helena. This is super fun. Here's the barn doors, and they look when the door is closed, they look like that. And you can tell the time of day by the angle of the sun as it as the sun passes through the slats. So I had to wait for the <laughs> for the sun to line up to take this picture. This is what it looks like when it's open. Um, anyway, it's just kind of goes on there's more and more fun games getting to the point where it gets interesting to me for, which is back to the construction and then you know but all right enough already but look somebody's having fun so we brought the kids to look at a um we went up to calistoga uh, for a weekend away and brought the kids and i showed them a, there was a pile of sawdust that the contractor had swept together it was on a weekend and the kids you know grabbed some blocks and started playing and I was like, yeah, this is way more interesting than architecture. Let's do some of that. Let's, let's play some, let's play some games. I mean, it's it's architecture, but but you know, just it's just joy and it's fun, you know, it's just make make believe. Well, here's a box of chocolates, um, but it's walnut. And this is actually uh I like to say that um Jen had the idea and I carried it to term. So we had this table in our living room and she's like, we need a block table. Like the kids can play, but you can also put a drink on it. So, so we, you know, she had this idea and I was like, that is a great idea. Let's do that. So here are the kids unpacking. This came from, um, I think Don actually did the prototype. And um, so it's a block table that functions as a coffee table. Um, and then we, you know, we were going to try to market it. And so Jen called some of her friends who were professional photographers and they did, you know, these kind of like, um, super fun, right? Um, super fun. Our friend Gary Yost, I'm sure some of you know who Gary is, and he's been kind of like a 
a pal of ours and he took this kind of trippy picture he's always goofing around with the latest technology but yeah that's that was that was that um so um this is around the time of the great recession and you know i sort of limped along with my practice for about another year and uh then it got really quiet so um good thing jen's business was still functional but you know those were really hard times and um the glass was not <laughs> half full it was not empty it was completely empty this was my life at the time i just felt with somebody who was so focused on work and my career and you know i, I loved my family and it was just more important than anything but so much of my part of my identity i was really completely reduced to this so what does one do when um you're a stay-at-home dad when you're you know that was not what you had intended to be there were many uh, we spent we spent a lot of time reading harry potter books <laughs> which thank god for for that um but i decided well let's make a children's book so you like boxes so let, how about a moving day so i started working on a, a children's book called dream house so these children move in to a new house it looks a lot like our house on millside actually and they start they're not interested in unpacking. They just want to play. So we're going to take all this stuff that has come off the moving truck and they're going, there's that box again. And they fall asleep on the sofa and then somebody on the sofa turns out is airborne and is jet propelled and they explore the built environment. This is uh, what I call I guess it's not called a master closet anymore. Let's get with the times. It's a primary closet. Um, just in time for just in time for Halloween. And uh, boy, this is drawing was so much fun. I think she's my favorite. But there, but you know, something for boys and girls. Um, anyway, um, let's sorry, I'll keep moving here. Um, this is dinner. There's Captain Hook. You know, everybody's dressed up, of course. There's Captain Hook feeding the dog more so. There's a there's a gelato cart. <laughs> um, oh, you know, here's the dad figure. Uh, I never, I was just I, Linda really tried to help me. I was trying to write the book. I I couldn't do it to save my life. So it's just just drawings. Still, it never it was never published. But this is the walk-in dishwasher. <laughs> a lot of kids to feed. You need a proper dishwasher. It's tubby time. So it's a mix between like a Turkish bath and some kind of, you know, E. coli nightmare. I don't know. This is, this is, um, it's night, it's nighttime. It's time for stories. And this is the bunk bed opera house. So these kids each have their own bunk and there's, you know, I think it's Linda actually on a rocking chair telling, telling a story. Yeah, that's what I imagine. So the kids are just kind of exploring, um, just uh, where's the story and all this? It doesn't really matter. Um, but this matters, and the reason I saved this drawing, which actually happens in the middle of the non-story, saving it for last, is because everybody loves a parade. And actually, this guy, who's he? He's actually carrying a level. Uh, I didn't. I never drew the bubble, but. I, this is one skilled guy. He's airborne in that level. It's you know, something all of us to aspire to. Everybody loves a parade. Jen used to get up. This is 2008. Jen used to get up first thing in the morning on Memorial Day and go down and, and put out the chair so we'd have a prime, prime spot. And um, Gwenny is not convinced that this is a good idea at all. Because <laughs> she knows, I think she knows what's coming. Uh, see, she's really still not convinced because the fire truck's coming yeah so our lives um you know um my early life was defined by the church and uh, our life at greenwood you know when you become parents it's almost like when your kids go to school you go to school too because you got to learn how to be a parent and so um i believe linda is actually forgiven of us for not enrolling our kids at old mill um you know we walk past it but uh <laughs> um it would have been great it all i mean you know there's no way to lose really um in this town with our friends and our family 
but we became involved with this kind of um, the school that was always on the verge of disappearing. And so Jen was on a, I don't know what you call a steering committee. And, and she said, we need more outreach and, you know, maybe we should do something in the parade. And she said, I think Danny's the one to lead that effort. And she told me, and I said, you got to be kidding. <laughs> I don't have time for this. But you know what? I did have time for this. And it was such a gift um, to be able to um, channel this kind of energy that had been really kind of dormant um, for so long. So this was our first effort, and I was super nervous. And the school was nervous. They're like, what are you going to do? And so, you know, we had a meeting with the faculty, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the idea is uh, we're going to have these bamboo poles and it's going to be this kind of accordion rainbow banner and then we're going to build this thing and we just got to work. And I was like, finally, I get to make something. I'm going to borrow this chainsaw. We're going to make this float. And here's Nell. Uh, Nell. She's learning how to work a ratchet. She's, she's putting this to, and not to be outdone. Gwen's going to get involved too. And um, we're putting our rainbow canopy on this and this is what it looked like. This was in um, 2009, and it was just a revelation. People had so much fun. The response from the community was tremendous. Um, and we, you know, and yeah, it was, it was good for the school, um, even though it was just kind of good for everything. It was just, it was just fun. We had the kind of middle school um, bluegrass band playing on a float and, you know, good times. This, um, I think at a certain point, there was a backlash from the, the veterans and community that, you know, it's Memorial Day. Let's not forget what this is about. So um, we did this project called Silver Star. Um, Jen does this um, beautiful garland around the star, but we actually carried the star on his back like a fallen soldier. And uh, I think in all the years that we did the parade, I think the thing that I remember the most was uh, there was a, a man in uniform, obviously retired, and somebody spotted him. It was down almost down at the end of the route, and somebody said, we need to raise the star. So we walked over and raised this. We, we raised the star and saluted him. And, it, and it's yeah, you know, it's just amazing. It's great. Um, you know what this is about. So we made a a dove, built it in the gym. Um, it's kind of hard to see. Again, Jen made the olive branch. Greenwood salutes, and she actually did the um. I was just really struggling with the language, like, what, how do we say this? this is so sensitive? How do we say this? Greenwood School salutes those who died in war so that we could live in peace. Perfect. I mean, it's not per nothing's perfect, but it, it just, it was kind of like the great escape. How do you address this? Um, so, okay, so now we're getting really geometrical. This um, is a stellated, it's a stellation. I had to figure out how to make it, and then we made it. This really big, stellated icosahedron. 20 sides, each spike for 20 um, fallen servicemen. Uh, we carried banners for each of those names. 14 of them appear on the, the World War I memorial in front of City Hall. And one of them's, you know, my dad, he didn't die in war, but I don't know, he had passed, so it seemed appropriate. So that... That was, and I think, oh yeah, okay, this is the first video. <laughs> Meanwhile, reading Richard Strider and Earl Drake, Ronald is reading the names. So this is our penultimate um, effort. It was, uh, I was gonna say, we're gonna phone it in this year because I know the last year is gonna be really big. This um, was a really, this was, this was in 17 and oh my gosh, it's not like it's gotten any easier, but man, there were so many people who were upset and the flag was such a contentious topic, um, still is. But the idea was like, you know, we'd have the May, May, Maypole celebrations and here's the red, white, and blue, but, it takes every color to support the red, white, and blue. And um, that was fun to order. There's Jen preparing the, the flag. And here's um, our Iwo Jima moment. Is it, you know, you can't do this, <laughs> this is a team effort. 
you never know who's going to show up. That was the that was the crazy thing, and people always did to help. I mean, they, none of it could have happened, and it wasn't like we made people promise that they were going to come, but they just showed up with their kids, and you know, anyway, that that turned out well. All right, so I think we had done the patriotism. This was our final year. Gwen was graduating this year, and we just we just decided to have fun. I said, let's make a dragon, and we're going to put the kids up top. Um, we stayed late, 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 dressing the dressing the dragon, late, late, late. Um, and there they are, the graduating class at Greenwood School. Um, so fun. So much fun. And the kids, yeah, <laughs> we'd never go to the ceremony afterwards, but we were always praying that somebody from Greenwood would go in case we got the trophy, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, that was that was fun too. So um this is this is my this was my office on Miller. Uh, I was there for six years. Barbara Chambers is in here. Um, I don't know. It looks doesn't look like a cartoon of what the sole proprietor of a residential architecture practice with. <laughs> it's like a little doghouse. It was a great space. And then the pandemic happened. And as I told you, the recession was just absolutely laid waste to everything about me. And I thought, here we go again. So I called the landlord and said, the reason I have a month to month lease is because of this. I predicted this would happen. I'm throwing everything in a storage. He's like, okay. So I started looking around for warehouse spaces because I was going to work from home like everybody else. And um, But there are warehouse spaces and then there are warehouse spaces. And the work didn't go away. And after this sort of month of panic died down and people came back and said, yeah, we want to continue. And I was like, okay, actually I'm all right. But in the meantime, I'd found this space. I'd like to say that this is halfway between San Quentin and Home Depot. <laughs> Super high rent. This is when you take all your fanciest clients. Well, I found this building. It looks like that. It's super charming, right? Super charming. But inside, it looks like this. So this is the one of the first spaces I looked at. And I thought, wow, that's ridiculous. Somebody's going to have fun in there. And I looked at spaces and spaces and that were more size appropriate. And then I just, I came back to this finally and I, and I saw it and I thought, oh no. And I had Jen and the girls come and the girl said, dad, it's really big. <laughs> and Jen said, you need to do what you need to do. And so I did it. Um, and it was super scary. Uh, she said, you're daring yourself, aren't you? Because all these years, I've been dreaming and sketching all these ideas, but I couldn't take my eye off the ball because we had a mortgage and um, kids to get through school. It's like, well, this space needs stuff in it, and the only person who's going to fill it is me. So I got to work. Um, this is the first thing I made and installed. You see it's a nice empty space still. This is... Um, it's a triangle broken into other triangles and they're all facing the same point. So you can see I have my pandemic haircut, <laughs> the razor. Um, and this was kind of the, the seed of an idea I wanted to make. I'll go ahead and say the disco ball, but invert it. Um, this is the platform. These are the triangles that will create it. There is Hero. He says, son, my um, intern at the time. And we're, and we're putting this together and that's so it's like oh my gosh it actually works this is the door was super tricky we took it back apart and we had the mirror guys come and install the mirrors on it all right so this is this, we're, we're starting to reassemble it and it's getting really interesting um and this is how it turned out Kinds of fun and games you can have in there. Take your shoes off and go in. So honestly, I had no idea what to expect, but this is what this is what happened. 
Um, this has continued to be really so much fun. I have friends over. This is um, Beatrix, who's named after the Queen of Holland by my friend um, Dante, who uh, was there in Holland with me. Um, I love this picture. Uh, there's her thumb. She's obviously, you know, what is going on here? But she, she's not taking the picture. This is Dante, her mom. Um, and this is her dad, John. And what's happening here? You can see his hand and face reflected. This is the edge of the door. And this is a piano hinge. So if you want, come over anytime, just let me know, and I'll close the door. <laughs> you can spend as much time as you want in there. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It's just, it's kind of the interstellar moment here of um, just, I think this might be my favorite. Just it just goes on and on. You feel like you could take a right turn and come back in on yourself. Anyway, super fun. Um, just you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Next project. Um, this is actually the Palazzo Spada in Rome, on an upper level of. You know, this is not open to the public, but as a member of the Academy, we were given a tour. This is a south-facing wall, and they've cut a hole in it. And there's a mirror disc that shines a light up onto the ceiling. And what they've done is they've created meridians to track the movement of the sun across the sky, but it's reflected onto the ceiling. So I saw this in whatever it was, 97. And finally in 2020, I got to do my own meridian. So we had these skylights. What I did was there was already conduit up there. I was like, hmm. So I got more conduit and I made these crosshairs in the skylight. And the crosshairs create a shadow on the floor. And what I did, I moved in around just before the solstice. So 620, that's June 20th at noon. So the shadow would have been here. A week later, it's there. A week later, it's there. And it's like, okay, it's accelerating the rate of change. Here, the reason the shadow is a little bit off is because, you know, I'd come in on a Saturday and I would set my phone to go off the alarm every hour. So I'd run out and put a piece of tape down. And then I ran back to take a picture of this. And so that's why the shadow has already moved that much. Um, so I did this experience. I said, what are you going to do? Oh, so it's not a straight line. And anyway, it turns out that this shape is called an analemma. This is the movement of the sun. This is taken at the same time of day over a course of a year. Uh, and that's, I don't know. I think that's really interesting. Why? I don't really need to know. I just think it's just fascinating. So... So what I did was um, I replaced the conduit with a beam and a hook, and I took these moments and I drilled something into the floor at each spot, and I tied string, which I then ran back up to this new hook or ring, and then down to these bags of steel shot, oh, which each weigh three to four pounds. Um, anyway, you can see the analemma here, and the... Um, the string going, um, creating that shape. So, you know, it's, this is a terrible, this is just kind of like an experiment, right? You can't really see anything. If I, if I really wanted to show it, I would have painted the walls and I don't know, but that was this kind of experiment. Next up is the camera obscura, obscura. So basically if you create a dark room, that's literally the meaning of camera obscura. It's a dark room and you, make a pinpoint in it, everything that happens outside will be projected onto a surface inside. So we did one of these for Gwen's science project at Greenwood. This is Gwen. Uh, you go inside and, you know, through this hole, the image from outside will be projected onto the other side. I wanted to make my own, um, put it on wheels, uh, put a roof on it and board and bat. So it's like a little house. And this would be the thing that controls the light coming in, a door, um, to keep the light out. Um, this is what it was look like. And really, I, I designed it like this because I imagined that I could park it in the Depot Plaza on a fall day and just have kids, you know, come in and say, okay, this is, wow, who knew? Camera Obscura. Charge them a quarter to spend, uh, you know, five minutes or something. I think it'd be really fun. Anyway, I, this is as far as I got. Um, but I, I I did build it and I did get the wheels. Um, yeah, this is the point of entry for the light. And that's what it looks like inside. So I'll show you, I'll give you a little tour of what, what it's like to get inside it. 
So that's the charming view of the parking lot. These are actually double doors, the weather strip, because I didn't want any light coming in. There's black carpet. The whole space inside is black, except for the wall opposite the light source, which is white. So not good for people with claustrophobia to get stuck in there. So there's the there's the view out this little portal. And then I'm going to turn around, and that's actually projected onto the wall. And, you know, what I love about this is it is completely unmediated. That's just physics. I mean, it's just, I don't know, what it, whatever you want to call it. It's just natural. It just happens. So, um, again, if you have any ideas, it's just sitting in a corner of my studio taking up space right now. So, um, hopefully this is not taking too long, but um, this is the logo for my architecture practice. It's obviously the shape of the Tempietto. It's a the bird cage, but the door is open. So make of that what you will. But Jen and I love birds. Um, we have bird cage collections. <laughs> this is our Hendrix bird cage collection. This is my old office in that building next to Gurley. So the crow is looking inside of my bird cages. It's like never, <laughs> never more. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, you know, I wanted to build a bird cage and have a really fun environment for the birds. Um, so this is a dodecahedron. Um, and I wanted the interior space to be um, a stellation. The mistake was building the outside first. It didn't work at all. It was, it's kind of a disaster. So I ended up um, making part of it out of wood and the rest out of cables. Um, and you can see, you know, um, yeah, you can see that you know what's what's happening, what's happening here. And um, what I realized is that this is terrible for birds' claws. And uh, if they're they'll be sitting out here pooping on the floor, and I just thought, you know, I'm just going to plant some creeping fig and <laughs> call it a day, and see if it'll grow over it. So um, anyway, this is kind of a fun little video. Anyway. You get the idea. So I was left with the pieces of what was supposed to go inside it. This is the same shape that we carried in the in the parade. Um, but I wanted to do this is maybe too much. I wanted to do the five platonic solids nested. This is the icosahedron inside the octahedron. There's the octahedron inside the tetrahedron, the four sided four. Yeah. That then lives inside the cube different versions of the same thing, the cube. This is a good view. This is the cube. This is the four-sided tetrahedron. This is the octahedron with the eight, basically an Egyptian pyramid with a mirror image on the bottom, and that contains the icosahedron. Then finally, we this all lives inside the dodecahedron, and it ends up looking like that. Why do this? I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> it's just, this really, really fun. Uh, those are the five platonic solids. And so, you know, I was not making solids. Now it's time to make solids. So these are paper models that were made by a mathematician in Dresden um, in the early 1900s. It was Max Bruckner. And I thought, I want to be like him when I grow up. Um, so a lot of a lot of the world is full of you know so many polyhedra so little time. I decided to start with a great icosahedron, but we're not doing small stuff. I'm tired of making models. I want to build it really big. Voila, the great Icosa dodecahedron. <laughs> oh, 
Uh, anyway, like I said, so many polyhedra. Well, I've just been playing around. Um, you know, I, part of me feels like, all right, this looks cool, but why? So this is a dodecahedron. You make one stellation. You add that point. It looks like that. You add one to the bottom. Looks like that. You add a point to all sides, and you have that. So if a kid comes in, I have something to talk about. This is actually the final stellation of the dodec uh, icosahedron. This is the dodecahedron base, and then and then I was halfway through, and I thought, you know what? I think that's enough. I think that's <laughs> that looks just fine. Um, this is a tetrahedron. This is a compound of five tetrahedra. So there's five of these in that. Okay, so there's that. Okay, so I was buying a Christmas tree over here um, at the Marin Civic Center. And I thought, what is this? What's going on here the rest of the year? Well, duh, it's the Marin County Fair. So I contacted them and I said, I know, can I make something? Or you know, I, they came over to look at the studio and they're like, yeah, you know, the theme is art, agriculture, and community. Can you do something along those lines? Or, you know, I said, well, let me think of something. And then look, this happens. Right? There's so many things to be upset about in the world. And this really upset me. Um, you know, those are sunflowers. You know, um, it's not like anybody killed them, but, you know, this is kind of, um, just, it's just, you know, the, the nobody knew this. I mean, we generally didn't know that the Ukrainian flag is a blue sky over a golden field. And, you know, what's the gold? It's This is the sunflower that people chose to express their solidarity with um, the people who are suffering. And, you know, I would say suffering on both sides. Um, and there's some, you know, I don't know, I'm going to talk about the geometry, but, but I was just like, oh, I had so much energy. I was like, I'm going to take a month off from work and I'm just going to build this thing with whoever will help me. And I want to make it as big as I can without having to operate heavy machinery. So um, this is the idea I came up with, this kind of pylon and then this big thing with the net. This was important to me. And so here's Marlene and Tom's son helping out. Um, Here's the neck, here's the disc, here's the dream team. Jen and Rachel working on the disc florets. There's Jen uh, presiding over the, the disc florets. Here are the ray florets loaded into the truck. It was too big, to act, you know, my studio is pretty big, but it was too big to fit in there. So we had to unload it at the fairgrounds and I couldn't even build it. It's a union venue. So I wasn't allowed to touch anything. Um, so, you know, but they agreed to pay for the assembly and um, those guys are professional carpenters. So this is not kid stuff. This was, you know, this is going to be outdoors in the wind. Anyway, it was really, really fun to watch them. And they, and they, they were having a great time um, building it. And here is the first, here's the first ray, um, the bottom ray. And then starting to take shape and what was so fun was that they were assembling the ferris wheel at the same time <laughs> it was really it's really great to, to see this kind of rotating around and adding elements um yeah so that's here's my kind of screed this was actually an op-ed i wrote to the ij um kind of just just taking on a middle ground and saying you know look we're upset but look you know the russians developed the sunflower and they both you know, it's like, look, they just, these people just want to get back to work and feed the rest of the country and the, the world. But anyway, you know, despite all that, it was a happy moment. Um, you know, exhaustion in a way is, is sort of the perfect complement to joy. Um, and there it opened and, you know, it was, it was well received. Um, oh, yeah. So this is, uh, this is kind of longish, but. Um, there's Hero, uh, Nisa's son. And actually, Nico is here. There he is. There's Nico. Oh, um, there's Giliana and Dima, um, the Ukrainian couple who moved here after the beginning of the war. They came over and gave me their blessing. And then the team comes. I spent a lot of time alone. But when the team comes, and you never know who's going to show up. 
It's the best. It's not just me in a vacuum. No, the gratuitous drone shot. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Anyway. Um, meanwhile, back at the studio, um, winter solstice was coming. We had our first winter solstice gathering. I wanted to create this thing hanging from the ceiling. Um, oh yeah, time to go. Okay. Um, anyway, this that that's what they're made out of. Um, Yeah, let's skip this part. Um, the next year we did like a sphere. Um, and it was we tried to make it fun by letting people light the candles themselves. In some ways it was kind of a disaster, but um maybe we there's no way we could light the ones up top. We tried to climb up the scaffolding, you know, but it was but it was a community thing, um, and super super fun. So this was been my incubator. It's not empty any. It's not empty anymore, is it? <laughs> so um, three and a half years later, and, and I'm meeting up in Petaluma, and I drive past this building. What's that? It's for lease. So, um, yeah, we didn't do anything. I told Jen about it. She's like, "Wow, it looks really beautiful." Um, and then I was, I don't know. I just cut to the chase. So here's Petaluma. Uh, that's that's where it is, and that's its kind of pole position. It's like an anchor tenant in the outdoor mall that is Petaluma. This is the main drag. Um, and we went to we went to look at it. Here's Jen and the girls. This is Father's Day. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So before you know it, um, Jen and I are making presentation to the local Petaluma artists and you know mayor and whatever. This is the space uh, explaining what we want to do. Uh, what's what's going on here anyway? Is it a church? Is it an empty box? Yeah. Is it a school? I don't know. It's it's all of the above. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. So this is kind of a joke that I put together. Um, this building would be a great place for a birthday party, fundraiser, book reading, product launch, blah, 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 blah. All of the above. Answer Z, all of the above. Let's call it Hall of the Above. A community event venue in Petaluma's iconic landmark building. So um, we posted that on the front door. Uh, we put a, put a, posted a letter, Dear Petaluma, introducing ourselves by name, because, you know, we're not some sort of multinational. <laughs> it's just a couple of people who have taken the incredible step of signing a lease on this building. Um, and this is meant to be a um, community venue. It will be the seat of my practice. Um, you know, I'll be in the attic, basically. Um, but it's really a building that's owned by the community. Um, everybody has a story about this building. It's an incredibly charismatic building. Um, and we're just thrilled to be uh, embarking on this next chapter. I think that's it. I'm not sure what happens next. Are there questions or am I so over time that, uh, We have any questions? Um, we first looked at the building in February. I took four months to negotiate the lease with the owner. Um, it was very price reduced. Um, and we signed the lease in June. We're still working on the building permits. Right now it's permitted for 49 people, which is not enough. Um, so now I'm in the other side of the architectural equation, having to pay for the permits and the construction. So we're gonna add some bathrooms, add an emergency exit, 
and hopefully we can start construction in, in January um, and open um, you know sometime next year. Um, wow. Um, yeah, weeks, maybe three to four weeks for one drawing. Um, yeah, they were, you know, it was in, you know, as an adult, like I, I used to think that, oh, when you're an adult, you get to work all the time. <laughs> no, that's the easy part. Being an adult means you have to take care of all the other stuff too the kids and the bills and the paperwork and all that kind of stuff so the idea that i'd have that much time to work on a drawing is just in retrospect an incredible luxury it's like being a monk <laughs> which is no fun <laughs> Of your ideas in terms of, oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just curious about your thoughts on AI and how you could, just for the sake of time, come up with some idea and then have the AI generate some of your ideas and visions in terms of just the multi dimensional yeah. uh, spatial elements and physics and all of these things. Is that yeah. something you're interested in? Yeah. So the the one of the one of the you know, various frustrations of my architecture practice, besides the many obvious things like dealing with planning commission and, you know, cost and all these kinds of things, is that from a creative point of view, everything is so remote. I make drawings of buildings that other people construct. And part of what I have really enjoyed about what I'm doing now, you know, on in my weekend warrior mode, is um, I get to make things. And you learn things, you see things, you understand things when you're making them, and you can make changes on the fly. And I think that the more you kind of outsource that process to another process like AI, I think it removes an element of, it's not a moral judgment, like I could go there, but um, you know, I just wanna be more involved. Like we're, I think of these things as, they're like cave paintings. I, they're just, they're supposed to be handmade. They're supposed to be rudimentary. They're supposed to um, reflect the, our status as, you know, like, we just, we just don't know very much. <laughs> and I think, um, and what I'm doing right now is very, very simple um, geometrically. And I'm building, you know, through iteration, learning how, what's doable and what's interesting and, uh, testing these ideas. Um, AI, yeah, wow. If, if um, a, a, a young person who's interested in that wanted to come to me and ask me, you know, so I, I like what you're doing, can I help you? And I would say, yeah, sure. But for me personally, I like to say that my head is firmly planted in the sand. And by the time AI really begins to impact what I do as an architect, and it will, I'll be gone. And that's okay. Well, I loved your presentation and um, I enjoyed your uh, the slides of your children's book, which you said you had not published yet. So I just want to encourage you to finish that up with Linda's help. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it doesn't need words. It doesn't need words. It says a lot just in the pictures. Yeah, I don't think you need to so. add words. Maybe so. I would call you a true Renaissance man. And I wonder um, how many other fields you've um, had the time to delve into to see how they relate to what you're doing. Um, I'm a chemist, and so I'm looking at your geometric shapes and all of that, and and how you know crystalline structure and the importance of the tetrahedron in organic chemistry and all. That. Have you yeah. 
Um, has anybody poured any of that in your head or have you discovered it yourself that the interrelatedness of your work with other fields? I, my, my skin is tingling. Um, yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, you know, uh, geometry is just an, it's an illustration of things that are kind of happening around us. And um, I wanted for years and years to find an old chart of the periodic table. And at the Alameda flea market a couple of months ago, I found one. And I was just, I couldn't believe it. I bought it for $150. Like I would have paid a lot more for this because it shows you, it shows you how molecules bond and it's all that stuff. You know, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, that's a that's a longer conversation, but the answer is yes. Um, you know, and really I, there's no, um, you know, I'm interested in all kinds of things and music, is clearly, you know, it's there's there's geometry and, and math in, in that as well. I don't need to know too much, but knowing that there is a relationship, it's kind of like if you're a person of faith, you know, there's a lot that you have to take on faith and and there's a certain kind of pleasure in in just sort of you know thinking about it. Yeah. Anyway, that's a great question. Thank you. Well, following up on that question, I'm fascinated to know whether the, your upbringing, because I know you started nine years in Singapore and uh, you were uh, a biracial couple, your parents, and then you come to the United States. How did that inform you as far as your desire to go into the work that you've chosen? Um, I, I don't, it's hard to, I mean, it's always hard to say when you're talking about yourself, you know, how much is, um, kind of innate and was in you and, and how much you're a product of um, those experiences. But, um, there's, a, it's funny, there's a lot of, a lot of architects who are preacher's kids. <laughs> um, so, I'm a PK too. Oh, you are. So sorry. <laughs> You know, yeah, I, and I had it both sides, so that was that was a lot. But you know, I, you know, I, I'm a, what you call a reverent agnostic. Um, yeah, it, it 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 shaped me in in deep ways, and I think you know, growing up abroad and coming here, um, that for sure gave me a curiosity about the world. Um, and I didn't talk about. I mean, we were you know we travel a lot. That was I felt like part of the curriculum for the kids, and just to fun for me and Jen too, but to really you know, show the kids the, the world. Um, yeah, so that's probably from them. Um, it's a bit of a reach, but you know, I've been um, talking to um, local craftsmen in Bali uh, who make things out of all kinds of stuff. And the idea that you could make some of these um, pristine kind of crystalline forms out of organic materials, that to me would would be like a great um, sort of a, a great positioning of what what I'm trying to show is that like look we're just we're so unevolved um, but we can aspire and the way that we stay true to the fact that we're you know so limited in so many ways is that we just we don't get too fancy like I'm not a futurist although I love astronomy and I just love knowledge and physics and I read about all the developments you know that that science is providing for us. That's absolutely fascinating, but kind of a non-answer, but that's the best answer. Yeah. Okay, sure. Do we have any more questions? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. This really like, really means a lot to me. Thank you for listening, yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.